Well, good morning, River City. How are you this morning? Good. Happy 4th of July. It's fun that it lands on a Sunday. We get to celebrate a little bit together. Would you stand with us this morning? We're just going to enter into worship. Father God, we are grateful to be able to stand in your presence this morning. God, it's our pleasure and our honor and our privilege to be able to worship you. May we never take it for granted, Lord. Be in this place. We invite you in, Father.
weight of what we're doing in this room. I know for myself, I can be guilty of just coming in out of routine and singing songs because that's what we do when we get to church before the message. But something this week that I've just been thinking and praying a lot about, something the Lord's been speaking to me about, and it's reflected in the songs that we're singing this morning, is just the power and the strength and the sacredness of what we get to do when we get to worship. Something that not only we in this church, but churches across the world, churches throughout history, that the heavens, the earth, everyone together joins in, praising the King of kings and Lord of lords. In the book of Revelation, John writes, Then I looked and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. That's what we're doing here this morning. We're joining in with all of heaven. Father, we worship you because you are worthy. Yeah. 
the promise your bearing body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on our living hope. You are our only hope. I thank you, Lord, that you have set us free. This weekend, as we celebrate freedom, may we never forget our freedom comes from you. In creation, you declared it. You designed us for freedom. And then, Lord, when we sold ourselves into the slavery of sin, you bought us back on the cross. So we're yours set free twice. Thank you. Thank you that you created us to be free. You've filled us with your spirit and empowered us to live as free people. No matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, because we're not alone, we are empowered to walk in the spirit. Only, the only place that true freedom can be found is in you. Remind us of that so good we worship you I pray for those who maybe are feeling bound up by circumstances whether they be family or work or financial or physical whatever it is they feel bound up I pray that you would remind us our hearts our spirits our souls and our minds are free in you help us to walk as free people we love you and we worship you speak to us today as we follow your lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't he good? Thank you, worship team. Hey, before you're seated, why don't you take a moment, greet someone, let them know you're glad to see them, tell them happy fourth. Well, good morning, everyone. How you doing? <clears throat> doing all right? Let me say formally, happy 4th of July. It's, it's okay to say that, right? That's, that's okay? Oh, good. All right. Today we celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which is really the formal founding of the United States of America. 
And unfortunately, a whole lot has been done in recent years to tarnish the image and the reputation of the United States. And I'm not talking about appropriate self-reflection, which is really good. We should always be looking and seeing, hey, what are the sins that we need to repent of and that we need to walk differently in the future? That's a good thing. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the absolute reinventing of history to cast a negative light on every aspect of the United States. Some of this is done out of a, just a stunning ignorance of history, and it is stunning when you actually, if you like, can open a book. A cursory web search will show some of the error of much of what's being said. Others, it's not just ignorance, it's actually intentional and malicious deceit by those who would love to gain control and gain power and gain influence for themselves. And they'll manipulate and misrepresent to do that, unfortunately. I mean, one that we're recently dealing with and that we're talking about all the time, it seems to be everywhere, is trying to cast slavery as a uniquely American sin. And anybody who's ever studied history at all knows that's laughable in its face. Slavery is a sin that is a human sin, and it is old. It is as old as history itself. Everybody knows that. Slavery is a deep and a dark sin of the heart where one person tries to use whatever advantage they can find to completely take the freedom and the life and manipulate and use the life of another person. Scripture talks against that. God's word speaks against that. And we understand that is a dark sin of the human heart. But to say that that's unique to the United States is ridiculous. Long before the United States was even a concept. We wrestle with this. After the United States made slavery illegal, slavery continued in other places around the world. Legally up until the 80s. And it still happens around the world today. There are actually still people enslaved. I think it's important to look at history and see the things that were done wrong and say never again. That's an important piece. What are the people who right now are actually experiencing that? What are we doing about that? I can't change the history, the past. I could do something about that. But that's not why. Honestly, for all of its sins, which certainly are numerous, you don't have a nation as wealthy and powerful as the United States and as influential without sins. For all of our sins, The United States is truly a unique nation. Honestly, if you look at the founding and you understand the founding, the United States was founded on a uniquely biblical worldview. An interesting study, if you have the time and you want to look into it, is the stark contrast between two revolutions that were really only 15 years apart. The American Revolution in 1776 and then the French Revolution in 1776. The French Revolution was rooted and birthed out of the humanistic ideals of the Renaissance, while the American Revolution was uniquely centered and shaped by the Judeo-Christian framework of the Reformation, and it shows up everywhere. We don't even even understand the difference. Humanism, basically, it's the idea that man is at the center, and the, the core understanding of mankind from a humanistic perspective is that man is basically good, and we're getting better. I guess humanists don't have, like, newspapers or the Internet. The difference is a biblical worldview, which was instrumental in shaping the United States, understands the basic core concept. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. At our core, mankind is fallen. And apart from a Savior and a Redeemer, we will do sinful, self-serving, broken things every time. We'll do exactly what we talked about. We will exploit other people. We will rebel against God. We will tear down relationships, tear down societies. That's what the sin nature does. Sin destroys everything it touches. And the biblical understanding, and the founders understood that. Something we talk about all the time when we talk about government, we talk about the separation of powers, right? The three branches of the federal government. We understand that each have been given powers, different powers, the executive branch, the legislative branch and the judicial branch, to, and we call it checks and balances. Do you understand that's from a 
Reformation biblical worldview that says mankind is sinful, and if you put all the power in one person or in one group, they will abuse it every time. Look through world history. You give all the power to a person or to a group of people, and pretty much bat in a thousand as far as abusing that power. That's because of sin, the sin nature. And the founders of the United States understood that, and so they built some things. Not only the separation of governments on a, on a, on a federal level, but the fact that we're a republic. And so there are certain powers that the states have. And so there's very much this accountability and this distribution of power, and that is rooted in the idea that mankind is inherently sinful. That's just one small example. If you look through the founding, you see it over and over and over again, and it's a fundamentally different foundation. The U.S. has definitely committed sins in history. And to pretend we haven't, and I don't know anybody who actually does. I don't know anybody who doesn't acknowledge them. Because the one thing I think the U.S. has done is it's worked very hard to acknowledge the sins of its history and to learn from them. And to say we're going to be different moving forward. And that's exactly how you should respond to sin. It's called repentance. I just want to say today as we celebrate the 4th of July, it is appropriate and right to be grateful for our nation. It's also a really good, healthy perspective to be grateful for the freedoms that we enjoy. It is appropriate and right to love the people of our nation, love our communities. It is appropriate and right to desire God's best, his blessing on the United States of America. And that's what we do today. We pray for that. We pray, God bless America. And so what I want to do is I want us to actually take time, take a moment and pray for our nation. I love the verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And listen, this sounds so good to me. I will heal their land. Boy, we could use some healing, couldn't we? Couldn't we use some healing? But if we will humble ourselves and pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways, the word says he'll do that. Hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. So let's do what that passage of scripture says. Let's pray for the United States of America. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you did create us for freedom. And I thank you that we have had the blessing of being able to live in a nation that has had unprecedented freedom for most of its history. Unprecedented in world history. And we have been beneficiaries of that. Not because we deserved it, not because we did anything special, but because you are gracious. And we thank you for that. We give thanks that we have enjoyed the blessing and the privilege of being raised in this place. Lord, we acknowledge the sins of our nation. You don't take a nation this big and this wealthy and powerful and with this many people, all sinful apart from you, all fallen apart from you, and you don't have a place like that without a lot of sin and brokenness. And Lord, we do, not just in our history. Today, we do. <laughs> Way beyond just the sin of slavery. That's a big one, but Lord, there's all kinds of other big ones. How we treat other people. How we thumb our nose at you, our creator. How we rebel against the things that you've designed. All the areas, Lord, where we have said, we know better. Forgive our nation. Forgive our sin. Lord, we humble ourselves. Lord, in the church, we've done this. We've chosen to follow the, the humanistic path that says, oh, we're basically good and it's all about us. Forgive us, Lord. And I pray that you would set us free by the blood of the cross, that symbol of our freedom. And Jesus, we worship you and thank you. And Lord, we do pray that you would bless this nation. Lord, I pray for our government's leaders. I pray on a federal level. I pray for our president. Vice President, Lord, I pray for both houses of Congress. Lord, I pray for our state leaders, governors, and legislatures. 
I just pray, Lord, that you would bring a revival. I ask that you would raise up missionaries in Washington, D.C. and the capitals all around this nation and that there would be missionaries who would lead legislators and leaders to the Lord and, and that there would be a revival and a move of leaders saying, what have we done? And who would turn back to you and who would trust you and would lead us in the principles that you created us for. Lord, we are so thankful for this gift of prayer. Sometimes it feels like we can't do anything. Lord, we can pray. And so we honor you and we bless you. And today, we pray for this nation. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless America. If you've been around River City any length of time, you know that each year around June, this year I had to do a little bit later just because of some of the stuff coming out of the pandemic, I try to take at least four weeks out of the pulpit where... We have some other great preachers here who, who share, and it gives me some time to step back, to pray, to read a little bit, and to kind of think through and pray through the upcoming year. And so that's, I'm in the midst of that right now, okay? In fact, next week, I'm actually going to be up at Landmark Church with Ryan and Rachel, and, uh, you know, they've gotten started, they've got, they're in their location, and so Ryan gets to be the uptight pastor trying to figure everything out, and I get to be the kind of hip, cool guest speaker, which, you know, <laughs> that's always fun. It's fun being that guy. So be praying for that, praying for them. But uh, last week, Pastor Mike started, kicked us off and started a conversation out of the book of Titus that was really, really excellent with an excellent testimony that we heard from some of the work that he's doing with a whole group of people from River City in a neighborhood called the Glen. So he's going to continue that, continue in the book of Titus. So give it up for Pastor Mike. Thanks, Thanks Pastor Mike. Appreciate it, man. Good morning, everybody. Happy 4th to you all. Excited to be here. Uh, real quick, on the, the 4th of July, my favorite part of the fact of being in this country is some of the things framed in our original documents. And in particular, when I think of the Constitution, I think of the First Amendment, and it says that no law shall prohibit the free exercise of religion. I am grateful. I am grateful that that line is in our government. Why? Because what it does is it allows the church to be the church. And that's what I want to talk about today. We started a conversation last week about the church being the church. And when we face a world that is broken and divided, we're like, who's going to do something? We should all turn and look in the mirror because it's the church's job to help reform and to reframe the world. And so we, we started a conversation last week, and I just told my story about how looking at the news and seeing some of that uh, brokenness, I just asked two law enforcement officers in our church, I said, what communities around here, around our church, do you think of when you think of what's going on in the world. And they gave me a neighborhood, and that started a journey for me. And you met uh, one of the residents in there who's become a real partner for us uh, last week, Miss Kay, shared. And just kind of opened my eyes about uh, what does it mean to minister in a broken world? And we said last week that the wise and the faithful are doing something about it. And along the journey, there's a lot of lessons, I think, that I've been learning. And so this morning, I'm just talking about lessons from the hood, about how it is that we are to... Um, engage in the world in which we live. Now, I want to tell a quick story. I, one of the first things that we've done recently here is uh, do a small group in the neighborhood. And the small group that I'm a part of is not one that I would have uh, originally thought of starting. In fact, it kind of gives me a little bit of a flashback to when I first became a Christian because at the age of 20, I gave my life to Christ. And one of the first things I found was that I was a trophy. A trophy for who? A trophy for my mom because my mom and all her cronies or her old Christian cronies who'd been praying for me for so long realized that Mike was now a Christian. And so I went home and I realized that I was like a, just a piece of leather, a head on the wall, man. They were like, look at Mike, he's become a Christian. And she would show me off to all my friends and she would, oh, look, and they'd put their hands all over me and tell me all the stories of how they prayed for me and what they had done for me. And it was it was miserable. It was terrible. And I found myself, she'd invite me to her prayer studies, and so I'm sitting in a circle of old ladies as they're praying, and I'm like, I am so uncomfortable right now. This is terrible. But I was. I was a trophy, and because my mom had prayed for me for so long, and here I am now doing ministry in this new neighborhood, and I'm in a Bible study, and who am I with? I'm with a group of senior ladies. Yeah, no lie. It's just, you know what? The Lord had opened up the door, and so we're sitting there, and so we're in the Bible study the other day, and we're reading through First Peter, and it starts talking about, okay, get rid of all anger and malice. Those were a couple of the words that came up, right? So now, it's time to talk, and everybody's starting to share their conversation, and no lie. Okay, listen. You've all seen these videos, right? These videos of like that 
that scene in McDonald's, for example, or a fast food point where like a fight breaks out of the counter? Has anybody seen these videos? Am I, you know, I hope I'm not the only one, but yeah, a fight breaks out where you got thrives being, fries being thrown and punches are thrown and there's a whole scuffle and insults. I'm like, who acts this way, right? And I'm seeing the video, I'm like, okay, that's how the internet works, right? It filters the extremes and it kind of feeds you into your feed, right? I'm like, okay, that's a one in a million, right? People don't behave that way, right? Well, here we are, we're sharing about anger and malice and no lie, two of the four people in our small group are start to tell their stories of the fights they've had in a fast food restaurant. I'm like, are you kidding? She's like, one was like, oh yeah, I was in the drive-thru and they said this and they said that and I took my 36 ounce cup and threw it back in the drive-thru window. I'm banned from that restaurant now, she says. She says. And then another one says, oh yeah, well, I got one. I was in this restaurant and then I took the tray and I threw it right back at them and went clanging everywhere and then the manager came out and we started yelling and I got banned from that restaurant. I'm like, this really happens, right? One in a million episode? No, I'm 50% right here in my small group right now. I'm like, oh boy, Lord, we got some work to do, don't we? But that's what we're dealing with when it comes to, okay, I'm going to engage a broken world. You're going to encounter stuff like that. Like, okay, what do we do? How do we approach it? What do we think? And one of the first lessons, I think, from working in an environment like that is just to realize, as I'm looking at that, I'm listening to the story and saying, okay, I can't equal what they just said, right? They better me at every point of, the, of the, the story. But I do know that what they're talking about is in my heart too, right? So we're equal, right? I'm not better than them. I'm not judging them. But I know that we all struggle with the same thing. And what it really comes down to is when it looks at the world in which we live. And, and you got to think for a second now. You might not be in that neighborhood, but you're in a workplace or you're in a family or you're in a neighborhood or you're in an environment and you got to do, what do I do to engage the darkness that I encounter in my world? And here's the bigger question. When it comes to ministering, is to think about for a second what God is thinking. Because when he looks down on the world, what does he see? Does he really see the hood and then the not hood? Or the hood and then the good neighborhood? Or the bad people and then, oh, those are the good people? Is that what God sees when he sees the world? Or do, do you think for a moment that you look at the world, God would say, you know what? The whole thing is a hood, right? The planet, planet Earth is the hood. And I sent my son to die for the hood so the hood could be redeemed. You see, that's the message, right? So when it comes to ministering to the hood, that's, that's a mission that we're all engaged in. So what are the lessons that we can do? And for me, kind of feeling over my head, I'm like, man, Titus has given me a whole lot of instruction and encouragement when it comes to engaging them. So that's where we want to dive into today. Now, why you need this? Because you're gonna, if you live in the hood, then you need to do something about it. Otherwise, what? You're going to ignore it, right? You're going to put a bubble around your life and say, oh, you know, that's how those people live, but we live differently. You're going to be not engaged. Maybe you tried and you quit and you got discouraged. Maybe you're the realist in the room and you just said, you know what? Human efforts don't make any difference and so the smart people don't do anything at all. Maybe that's you. And so what we need to do is we say, okay, but what is, what is God really saying to us about how we're to engage this broken world? And what can Titus share with us? I think the best way to start again with Titus is a map, okay? So for map lovers, let's throw up the map. Who is Titus ministering to? Titus was ministering to this island called Crete. That was his assignment. That was his hood, if you will. And so anytime, you guys can put that map right on up. There we go. So to make us all, we all fall in love with the Mediterranean when Texas is overlaid on it. So there it is. We all love the Mediterranean now. So uh, Titus is ministering to this island in the blue called Crete. Okay, that's his ministry. And he is a part of a team of people that are ministering. Because when the gospel got a hold of them in the first century, what they did was they took it all over the globe. The world is the hood and everyone needs Jesus. So let's get it out as fast and as effectively as they can. And they went all over. And so if you remember that in the history of the Bible, one of the leaders, Apostle Paul, he basically circled that globe a bunch of times, doing the work of the ministry, sharing the gospel. And on his last circle, if you will, that he was arrested in Jerusalem, and he was put on a ship as a prisoner, and he was taken through the Mediterranean, and they landed at the island of Crete. And so you can see him, and he's in his chains, and his, his freedoms are bound, but he's a servant of the Lord, and he looks at Crete, and they try to winter there in the ship, but they got the big idea, no, no, let's go winter over here, and so they cut loose other moorings, and the big wind comes, and it grabs the ship, and it basically throws it out to sea, 
So they basically wave Crete goodbye, and they travel on for two weeks being thrown by the wind. They crash, they break. Eventually, Paul gets to Rome as a prisoner, and he's there for two years. Now, the, the cool thing about it is to think about Paul as a prisoner in Crete, because what was probably going through his mind as he's a prisoner, as his freedoms are gone, and he's going to Rome for trial, is he looks at this island and says, you know what? These people need the gospel. Mental note. Come to Crete one day. So fast forward, he's in Rome and he's in prison. He's ministering. The book of Acts ends right there. Paul's ministering in Rome. Church tradition shares afterward that Paul is released and he returns back to ministry. So what does he do? He grabs his main man, Titus, and where do they go? Back, right back to Crete. And they start to evangelize Crete and they start to go all over the towns. Paul has to leave because there's business all over the globe happening. And then he leaves Titus there. And so at one point at time, when, he, when we have the books of uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, Paul's writing these letters to his leaders around the globe, helping them, helping us to try to minister to the world which we live in. So at one point, you can see Paul up in Macedonia. He's up at there. He's writing letters to Timothy over in Ephesus, helping with that major church and the problems that they were facing. And then he also writes to Timothy down there. So Titus and Timothy have a lot of similarities Titus often gets overlooked, and so that's why I enjoy talking about him today. So that's where we're going to pick up in his instructions and help for Titus on how he's ministering to his community. So pick up in Titus chapter 2. This is what we read last week, and this is where we're going to continue our discussion. Titus 2.11. Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. This is the theological vision of a person engaging a broken world. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. What does the grace of God mean that has appeared? He's meaning Jesus Christ. This is past tense for Paul, for Titus. Jesus Christ has arrived on planet Earth. He has died on a cross. He has been raised again. He has entrusted the message of salvation to his followers who are now going all over the planet. That's what it means that the grace of God has appeared, offering salvation to all people. And the early Christians were busy about sharing that Every, everywhere there went. That's the theological vision that Titus had that we can have when it comes to us engaging a broken world. Now, the question is, what does the grace of God do in our life? He continues on. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Notice that word self-controlled. You're going to see it a number of times. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all the wickedness and to purify himself for people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So the bottom line, this theological vision, the grace of God has appeared and it purifies a people who are what? Able to, eager to do good. Why is it important that our first uh, amendment says that no law can prohibit the free exercise of religion. So the church can be the church. What is the church about? The church is a purified people who are about doing good. And they're doing it eagerly, generously, sacrificially, and with great impact all around the globe. That's what it means for the grace to have appeared. Now, I want to give you a picture of grace, okay? Because it's the concept that drives, it drives everything we do, okay? So let's look at a Another map, just because I love maps. So this is a satellite image from the geological survey. And so this area of the world, uh, we'll do a little test right here, okay? So this is like kindergarten level trivia, so you all can get this, right? So the tan area of the world, right? What, what does that represent? Anybody know? I didn't hear that. What? Desert. There you go, desert, right? So it's desert, right? There's nothing living there. And then you look at the green part of the world. What does the green mean? Civilization, growth, there's, gro there's things growing there, right? This right here, I would say, is a picture of grace. Why do I say that? Because without this resource that's coming, right, and this long, black, squiggly snake, what is that right there? The Nile, there we go, a little geography, right? And what is the source of the Nile? Lake Victoria, there we go. So Lake Victoria is providing this water that's going through this desolate desert and what is it doing? It's allowing growth and life to flourish. 90% of the Egypt lives around the Nile. Why? Because that's the source of life. You can't live without that. 
You can't live without the Nile. It's just a barren desert. So what is grace? Grace is that thing that's provided that allows life to occur that if it were not there would not otherwise exist. The grace of God has appeared, which gives salvation to all people. If the grace of God doesn't appear, there is no green. There is no growth. There is no life. And so who has the grace? It's the people who have been touched by God's grace, who have been changed by that grace. And so the grace of God is the fuel. It's the motive. It's the thing we have to offer, all right? And this is important because if you enter the world, you might think your good ideas are the thing that you really offer. And I'm not discounting your good ideas for a moment. But that's not the thing that's going to change the world. Your advice is not going to change the world. That cute saying that grandma used to say is not going to change the world. What changes the world, what provides life in a dead place, is the grace of God. The grace of God has appeared, which provides life. And so this emphasis on owning this and then taking it wherever you went. For Titus, taking it to this island of Crete. It was have this theological vision that if I come with the grace of God, and I commit myself to being purified and doing good, things will change around us. I'm going to read a few scriptures that emphasize the role of doing good, the role that that plays in the transformation of that island. Here's some of the things that said. First, on the negative side. This is what Crete was like before. Detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Okay, that's the desert, right? That's the normal conditions. But what happens when God's grace comes? Next one. Grace comes to purify himself of people who are his very own, eager to do what is good. Another one. Be ready to do whatever is good. Another one. Be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Last, next, last one. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. You see, the theme in Titus, the instructions, the vision, is God's grace coming to purify people who will do then what? Multiply good all over the place. Not a teaspoon of good. Not a good once in a while. You know, you think of the guy that does whatever he wants all year long, but the, the office organizes an, a volunteer day to Habitat Humanity, and they go and they work on a build a house for a day, and then he goes right back to his life and does whatever he wants to do. That's not the vision of doing good God had in mind here, right? The vision of doing good is not a teaspoon of good or an ounce of good. It's cargo ships of good. It's boatloads of good. It's as much good as you can muster and then add some more on top of that. Why? Because God's grace has been motivating and empowering you to do good. Because that's what the church does. That's how society changes. And that's what would change Crete. I'm like, oh, that's helpful. What does it mean to do good? And are we doing good? Now, I wanted to find that a little bit more, okay? So that's the emphasis. But again, what does it look like? What is it practical? And here, Paul is writing to Titus. Titus is instructing the leaders and then instructing the churches on what's to happen, okay? So again, we're in this chain of instruction, if you will. Here's where Paul begins of what good looks like. Good always starts with individual behavior, okay? Before, before you start the nonprofit, stop, stop, stop. Yes, it may result in that. God's grace may result in that, but stop. It starts with individual behavior, God's grace begins there. And how does it begin? It begins because of a healthy church. How does a healthy church become healthy? It has healthy leaders. So the start of this transformation is a focus on this priority. And here's what Paul writes to Titus. Verse 5. Here is his marching orders. The reason I left you, Titus, in Crete, was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Why is that important? Again, healthy leaders create healthy churches, which create healthy behavior. All the prerequisites of doing good. What does a uh, mature leader look like? Verse 6. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and who are not open to the charge of being wild or disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined, 
He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Where does doing good begin? It begins in this individual lifestyle of behavior. And the elder, the leaders in the church, they're the ones that model that. Okay, so when we think about this, one thing that's interesting is that, again, we're talking about, okay, health in the church, but we're also talking about brokenness in society. How do you bridge these? And here, there's a little insight, I think, into what Paul was writing, because a real interesting thing to do is take this letter of, to Titus, right? And he lists all these virtues that we just read, right? That was not an uncommon thing to do, right? Greeks, all kinds of Greek people would list virtues of what leadership would look like. In fact, there's a writing that you can find that uh, one of the Greek philosophers wrote. He wrote a short essay on what does it mean to be a good Greek general? Not a Christian. He's just writing on Greek general military leadership. And when he wrote of his virtue list, and you compare the two, you see some similarities. See some differences, but you also see some similarities. In particular, three words that Paul used about church leaders, this guy used about good generals. Number one, self-controlled. Good leaders are self-controlled. Paul said it. This guy said it about generals. Another one, Paul said elders are disciplined. Well, good Greek generals, they're also disciplined. He wrote, used the same word. Paul said their elders are not fond of money. That's one Greek word, but it just means you're not out for gain. You're thinking of the public good. Well, guess what? This guy wrote about generals the same. Exact words, word for word. There were four that were similar. Paul said, be clear-minded and sober. Paul said, having obedient children that obey. Paul said, a leader must be skilled at teaching. A leader must have a good reputation. All very similar to what were said about this general. So what, is he, what do we make from that? Well, we make for this, because... When Paul was looking at Crete in the world in which he lived, and remember, he's traveling all over the globe, right? He has an eye toward what God is doing in the world around him. The grace of God has appeared. It's this trustworthy <laughs> message. And he's devoted his entire life to this. I will give my last blood and my ounce to defend and to share and to promote this message all over the planet Earth, right? So that's eye number one. But he also had another eye of saying, who is my audience? Who am I called to reach? Who are the people I'm going to take this message to? And he knows what they believe is virtuous because they've written about it and they talk about it and it's in their culture. And so what he does in reading about church leaders, he says, church leaders, as you appoint these, Titus, you need to have a person that can overlap a little bit. Meaning, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what they hold true. There's a degree of overlap of commonality. And if you are choosing a church leader, if you're going to be a church leader, you'd better at a bare minimum exemplify some of the virtues that the culture holds do. So if they say you need to be self-disciplined, you can't appoint a wild church leader. Why? Because their message will have no reputation in the society. They will not be able to be disregarded. They will be of disrepute. They may not like your, your faith, but they won't be able to discount you because you don't act with virtue. And not only that, the gospel itself, the grace of God, begins with changing individual behavior. The gospel makes us more virtuous. We become more moral people. And so it has to be reflected in society. And so what is doing good looks like? Doing good first and foremost looks like doing good in my own personal life. Do I embody the virtues of what Jesus has taught us to be? And at a bare minimum, can I embody the bare minimum virtues of the society in which I live? Leaders, Christians, churches have to have that if they're going to be influential in the society in which they live. Okay, so he's talking about church leaders. Now he's going to go into individuals' life. He's going to talk about different age groups, different genders. He's going to talk about slaves. Here's what he says, verse two, or chapter 2, verse 1. He says, You, Titus, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, Self-control, there's a second time we've seen it. And sound in the faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Verse 4, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be the subject of their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. I got, I got to stop, just parenthetical right there. 
all of those instructions to the other people. And what did the young men get? Don't do nothing stupid, right? That's the young guy. Just don't be a bonehead. Don't be a meathead. Be self-controlled, right? That, that cracks me up because that's so true of <laughs> guys. But I think he continues on. And here he kind of, when it comes to young men, he had Titus in mind. Here's his instructions to Titus, the young man, the model. And everything, set them an example of doing what is good. And your teaching show integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Verse 9, teach the slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about our God and Savior attractive. Chapter 3, verse 1, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate, and always gentle toward everyone. So what does good look like? It looks like being this kind of citizen, this kind of person, these kind of characteristics. Because why? Because for the gospel to be effective, this grace of God which appears to be our salvation to all people, it has to be reputable by the people who are carrying it. Let me re- highlight just a couple things when it's... Sh- when he talks about our behavior and how it affects people and how they view faith, how they view Christianity. Here's what he said. He said, verse two, verse five, chapter 2, verse 5, he said, so that no one will malign the word of God. No one will speak critically of it. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. If you want to influence, you have to have an eye on what God is doing in your life and then another eye on what the world is doing and what they think of because your reputation is important from church leaders all the way down. So good, doing good, what does it mean? It means first and foremost, my individual behavior. Are we doing things? Are we at our best behavior? Are we showing that the message we believe has resulted in a transformation of my heart, a transformation of my character? That's the evidence that we have. That's one of the selling points, if you will, on why Jesus is so important and why our faith makes a difference. Now, we need to comment just a little bit on some of the the obvious things that stand out. First of all, talking about slaves. Talking about slaves. Obviously, slavery is wrong. Obviously, slavery is against the Bible. So why do they speak to slaves in that way? First priority is to think of this. What does the grace of God do? The grace of God, first and foremost, changes a heart. And that's always been the priority of the Christian message. That you have in the Roman Empire at this time, 20-30% of people are under some kind of indentured slavery. And so is a slave revolt the very first strategy of changing society? It's not. For them, as Paul was speaking, the very first thing is to get the gospel message out, which what? Changes a heart. And then from a changed heart, people begin to relate different. And so, I mean, think about this. You see how the slave's behavior, if they received the gospel, was supposed to change. Other letter, Paul wrote a slave owner. And said, okay, you, you own slaves. You have people who are indentured servants. You are now to treat them as a brother. And so now you have this weird tension in the church, right? Because you're in a church, you have slave and you have slave master, but both of their hearts are changed. And they look at each other and say, wait a second. We have all believed the gospel, and now all of a sudden we need to change our situation. Because why? Because I can't just look at you as a slave. I have to look at you as a brother. I can't just look at you as a master. I need to look at you as a brother. And now we need to figure things out. Well, what are we going to do different now? How are we going to change our circumstances based on what God has done in our life? And you've got to work through that. But what's the most effective change? Again, a revolt or a changed heart? And the gospel always points toward a changed heart. And that empowers us to make other changes. Another one is the young women. I said, young women, stay home and be busy, right? Well, let me say the obvious thing, first of all. Can I say without offending anyone that Star Wars hadn't come out during that time, okay? It hadn't come out yet. Why, why do I say that, right? Because Rey, right, she hadn't yet discovered her Jedi powers, right? Hadn't been known. She hadn't been trained by Master Luke yet, right? She hadn't taken on the Darth Lord Sidious, right? She hadn't yet fought and destroyed the evil threat all over the Empire, right? She wasn't yet the heroine, right? Star Wars is a story that came from our culture. Would everybody agree with that? Everybody say amen? Right. 
So when you think about what Paul was talking to young women, he's talking to young women 2,000 years ago in Crete. To be a virtuous woman, you were at home and you were busy. And you were managing your household. And you were taking care of your family. That's what virtue looked like. So as a Christian, and you're reaching your culture, what does virtue look like? Your gospel changes your heart. Does that make sense? So today, obviously, how you do that today? I mean, me and Jamie, we got married. We were both officers in the military, right? Can't obey that scripture. Sorry, it doesn't work, right? So what did we have to do? What we had to do is take the intent of it to say, okay, what's important is my individual behavior and what is a priority is my family. How do we together make sure our family is number one? How do we make sure we raise our kids in following Christ? How do we make sure that Jesus is always number one in our family as we are reaching the world in which we live? And we had to figure that out. And I remember we've gone through all kinds of different roles and responsibilities. I mean, there was a time where I was at stay at home and I remember having a little ball over my shoulder. And this is how I parented kids. I had just over my shoder like this and I'd walk around the house and, and they, I'm waiting for as a dad. I'm just waiting for the moment that they're going to get neck muscles strong enough so I can start to throw them around a little bit, you know, up on the bed, you know, the big five foot over the thing, you know, tossing them because that's, that's my way of raising kids. I remember there was time where Jamie is at home. I remember there was a time they were in childcare. I remember a time where we were homeschooled, a time when we had private school. I mean, we've juggled all over the place trying to figure out, but what's the main thing? For us to live a virtuous life is make sure our families are priority, our, our households managed well, and we're doing it all to honor God. So that's how you figure it out. And that's how we begin to uh, change and influence the societies because the bare minimums of reputation are important. Don't miss the older men. How about that instruction for the older men? I mean, the assumption here is that the older guys are leading these churches. They're leading people. They're leading the society. And so this idea like I'm retired and I'm just, don't bother me. I mean, that's not there, right? It's like Paul himself, the model of the older guy. He was in prison for four years. And so again, did he retire? No, he just picked it up and took on a new challenge. And so this idea of retirement, this idea that I'm just kind of the crass old guy with the dirty joke and I don't have any responsibility, I can't, you know, do anything for myself, that's not the model. The model is a virtu virtuous, older, respectful, self-controlled guy who has responsibility and he's leading churches, he's leading people, he's leading his family, and he's making a difference in the world. So all of it, all of it is just, in a way, instructive and countercultural and guides us that the beginning of doing good starts with individual behavior. So that's the basis. But obviously that's not enough because God's grace transforms our heart which transforms our individual behavior, then impacts how we engage society. And this is where we get to step out a little bit and figure out, God, what do you want me to do? Let me just share a little bit of uh, stories from uh, my work in the hood, if you will. So one of the things we did was we had to go to this new neighborhood. We knew nobody. Nobody trusted us. Nobody cared about us. Nobody cared about what we were about. They were just like, go away. So the first thing we did was that, okay, one of the needs they have, it's a low-income community, uh, food. So let's do a food pantry. And so every month, we bring in food, and Christian Assistance here boxes up some pallets of food, and we load it in a truck, and off we go. And we meet people, and we pray with people, and we serve people. We're there every month without fail, no matter if it's hot or it's rainy or it's cold. We're there, and they get to know us, and we're building relationships through that because we're doing good. It's good in their eyes. It's good in our eyes. We're doing good, and we're building relationship. And that's opened up a lot of doors. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of doors for us. Next thing we started to do is we started to realize, okay, what are the needs in the community? What are the things that they say are, are an issue for them? And one that was very obvious, it was just the, the lack of cleanliness in the streets, just trash and dirt. They would have said it's a problem. We saw it as a problem. And so it's almost like as you're diving out there and you're like, God, what do you want me to do? It's almost like, you know, the breadcrumb analogy. It's like I follow it to one breadcrumb. And I do whatever I need to do, and then you follow to another breadcrumb and do whatever you need to do. The next one was just the streets. And so we've led River City Serve Days out there. We've done a bunch of other side projects, cleaning up the most disgusting and problem areas of the thing. And guess what? They noticed that. People noticed that, that we're doing that. One of them we came, and boy, this one was unexpected, but we're doing a food pantry. It's our very first one, actually. And I was inquired, talking with a guy. I'm like, hey, what's going on in the neighborhood? And he's like, starts complaining about this flooding going on behind these houses. I'm like, flooding? What are you talking about? Show me. So 
took, takes me back there, and it's literally an entire section of street with probably eight different homes that were just uh, flooded out completely, right? Just 10 inches of standing water. You got insects and mold and yuck and rats, and it's just gross. I'm like, dude, nobody's done anything about this? This is terrible. And so started praying about that, and all of a sudden, follow the breadcrumbs, we started to put some pieces together, and we were able to take that huge problem and fix it. And so this is what it looks at now. We did new concrete. We dug out the whole drainage channel. We did wall. We got all the approvals. We ended up being kind of mediators between county and owners and residents. And it all worked out really smooth. And, and so when you look at that, you're like, man, that was a way to do good. Why? Was it what I thought going into this project I would do? No. But it's what they needed. It was the opportunity. And so, God, what do you want us to do? And we, we made it happen. And see, that's what God's grace looks like, Right? God's grace, when you think about it, the, the way to think about it is, is generosity. God's generosity. It's unmerited favor. When you think about our salvation, God gives us grace in terms of sending Jesus to die for our sin. Long before any of us said, hey, God, you know what we really need? We need you to send your son down to die for our sin so we could be saved, right? Nobody was asking for that. God knew that we needed it, and he provided it. And he, did he do it because we were righteous? No, he did it because we were, frankly, very unrighteous. Okay, so it's unmerited. We didn't do it, but God gave it. The word I think that best translates is generosity. You didn't earn this new drainage ditch, but we're giving it to you. Why? Because it's God's grace reflected in us. We're being generous. Generosity is a great way to think about it. Here's another one. A group from our church went and did a home makeover. So there's this one. This is a senior lady's house. Well, it was just in total disrepair, and so we put a lot of work into that. They asked me, they, hey, hey, what's our budget to do this house project? <laughs> what's your budget? That's funny. <laughs> there, there is no budget, you know? The budget is how generous are you feeling? That's your budget. But they did. They put it together and they got resourceful and they prayed about it. And so this is the, the finished result here. New landscape, new paint, new trim, new electrical, new lights, new fence. Just turned out marvelous. And now taking a real ugly house and just it becomes one of the ones that kind of lifts the neighborhood up. Why? Because there's an example of a, oh, that's a good looking house, you know? Not all of our houses have to be this way because we can change them. So that's what it looks like when you start to engage a broken world. It's just this breadcrumb idea of like, God, what are you, what's the opportunity before me that you want to work on? What's the thing that I can be involved in? What's the thing that they need? And then you, the thing that always comes back in my heart, how generous are you? Because it always comes down to this. Christians, how generous are you? It's not if the need's not there. It's not if people won't welcome your help or support. The question is always, how generous are you? Or are we not generous and distracted doing other things? Have we lost our focus on that? Hey, wait, the reason I've been purified is so that I'd be eager to do good. It always comes back to us and our individual behavior. And that's where I think, as we kind of wrap this, is we're going to end on this passage, which is the most beautiful and powerful part, I think, of the letter to Titus. Is this, again, this theological vision of what God is doing in our life, how it changes us, and the impact it can make on the world. And so let's read this together. Titus 3, starting in verse 3. He says, At one time you too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness of love of God our Savior appeared, His grace, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. You see, when you embrace this idea that God's grace and this spirit working inside of my heart is the hope of the world, and you realize that when you cooperate it 100% completely, it is profitable to everybody. There are a lot of people that don't think the church is the hope of the world. They don't think the church has anything to offer society, and they'll be quick to put you away. But listen, through our virtuous behavior, we make that a very difficult task. Why? Because our behavior is so different. Our virtue is so different. Our lifestyle is so different. 
our contribution to the world is so different. It cannot be easy to dismiss us or the message or the, the word that we share about Jesus Christ because God has worked in our hearts. And so the question really becomes is our cooperation with this generous putting of God's Spirit inside of our heart. You know God's Spirit is not happy about what's going on in the world, right? He doesn't like it. He's not satisfied. He's not content. He's a little bit perturbed in a very gracious, generous kind of way, if that makes sense, right? He wants to do something. Grace of God has appeared not just so that it would be bottled up, but that it would be shared all over the world. So the, the Holy Spirit, I like to think of him as being a little bit rambunctious. He wants to get out there. He wants to do things nobody else is doing. He wants to take risks that nobody else has taken. He wants to get out to the people who need him and who are hurting and broken and messed up. He wants to show off a bit to say, this part of the world nobody said was fixable. I'm God. I want to fix it. But he's going to use us because of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And so it comes down to us. Have we surrendered to that call inside of our life? For some of us, it really comes down to that first point as you've never surrendered to Jesus. Like you've never surrendered and said, Jesus, I need you to repent, of, uh, uh, change me of my wickedness. I need you to change my heart. You've never done that. And so because of that, he's never washed you. He's never rejuvenated your heart. He's never given you a new heart. You're living on the old. This morning, you can start. Do you want to be a part of the world that is being changed to the glory of God? Surrender this morning to Jesus Christ so his spirit in your heart can change you. And then you'll be useful to do good. I believe everyone has aspirations to do good. Everyone, whether you're a Christian or not. The question is not, do we aspire to do good? The question is, do we have the ability to do good? And God's spirit in our heart gives us that ability to do good. So this morning, you can do it right now. You can surrender and say, Jesus, I need your spirit in my heart to change me. For some of us, we have said that, but we are not doing good. Like we're not active and productive and like we can't sow side shows and talk stories about what we're doing around the world. And all that means is that we just need to say yes to the opportunities around you. Start with what's bugging you. Start with where you're discontent. Start with what you complain about or what you whine about. Start with just a simple, I have no idea where to start, God, lead me. If you don't have anywhere to start, jump in with somebody who it does. There are people around you that are doing good. But what it means is that you need to surrender to the Spirit because He's nudging you. He's trying to get you on board. He's trying to get you in the game. He wants to use you. Every single person has a role in this. Every single person. And so surrender to that. Allow God to lead you. I want to pray for us. I want to pray for us that God would use us. And as Jesus said, His words, He says, He says, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. And that's what we're talking about here. Holy Spirit, wash me so that I can have a part in Jesus Christ and what he's doing on the planet. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful that the grace of God had appeared. Nobody was sending letters to heaven requesting a Savior. Nobody was doing that. But Father, you saw that we needed it. <clears throat> you planned for it. You sent your Son because you loved the world so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. So, Father, I pray that you would do that today. Father, as we surrender, you'd wash our hearts by your Spirit, regenerate our heart, renew our heart, and God, help us to be useful to doing good. Father, where we've lacked passion, we've become discouraged, we're bottled up with fear. Father, renew us so that our heart can be fresh again, full of faith, full of generosity, so that we can give that generosity to the world around us. Help us, Lord God, where we have been quick to judge and slow to act. God, forgive us. We repent. Help us to be quick to love and quick to act, that you, we can do good works, and that works would be multiplied in boatloads, and that we can truly make use of this incredible freedom we have, this freedom of religion. Help us to be the force for good in our community and our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. God bless you guys. Amen. Thank you, Mike. That was super good. And the idea that, man, that place just knows us by, hey, we're the food pantry church. I think we should change our name to that, Food Pantry Community Church. We'll be good to go. Um, no, but I just love that idea that we're known by what we do, by what God does through us, and it's only by his grace that we can do that. So thank you, Pastor Mike. That was really good, really challenging for me and the things that God's leading us in. Um, a few things before you guys head out today. If you guys, and this is the most important thing, if you guys accepted Christ today, we want to celebrate with you. We want to um, just give thanks and um, celebrate just like it is in heaven. If 
If you guys did that, could you come and just tell one of us or text the word follow to 210-880-2181. We want to help you on your journey to real life, your real life in Christ. And so we just want to give you some things to help you along in that journey. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, text the word follow, 210-880-2181. Two other things. VBS is coming up in two weeks, and it's going to be awesome. Um, we are really excited. We want these kids to hear that message and just to come to know Jesus at a very early age. And so if you'd like to sign your child up or if you'd like to volunteer, you can do that either in the foyer or through our app. And last thing, today is 4th of July. As you've heard, if you didn't know, hey, it's 4th of July. Um, we have some cool stuff in the courtyard. It's not raining, I don't think. Um, if you guys would like to hang out with us for a little bit, we have hot dogs and a bunch of cool treats out there, some games. And we'd love to just celebrate and give thanks for um, a country that God gave us. And so we just want to give thanks. So, yeah, let's do that. It's going to be fun. We love you guys. Have a great week.